my window was created uh, in 2015 when I was a researcher at university in UPF. It all come uh, with the, the research that I've done in my PhD uh, about microwave imaging for medical applications. And uh, when I uh, was at UPF, we were trying to find uh, an application. No, it's like a technology push innovation, my mm -hmm. window. So we uh, had to, to look for a new application. And we came up to an unmet need that is the colorectal cancer detection at, at an early stage. And uh, well, we developed this project to satisfy this unmet need. Basically, what we do in my window is to develop a small radar that can be integrated at the tip of a standard colonoscope. And this helps the, the, the doctors to detect the polyps that are the precursors mm -hmm. of this cancer. So there's a direct link from your PhD research through to potential benefit applications to patients. I wanted to uh, be able to arrive to the society, no? to, to transfer this, yeah. this knowledge to the society to help patients. And uh, the only way to do so, it was to, to create a spin-off in order to be able to get resources for do the, 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 the clinical validation and all those things. This was not possible at university. And so we, ha we had to create the startup and look for a lot of grants, investment, and have a more flexibility you know, to do all these things. Yeah, and I think these days it's a far more common route for researchers to to go down or even to start thinking about what is the potential application benefit or the word we use a lot in the UK, the impact mm -hmm. of our research. But maybe 20 years ago, that wasn't really the case, but I think there's been a, a big change in yeah. that. So, I mean, from a general point of view, I've, I've spent a lot of time helping people in your position, trying to set up the, the spin-out company. And, thinking about you know, the intellectual property rights protection, thinking about the business plan, um, building the team of people that can launch the company. But what was your experience? How did it actually sort of happen? In fact, what, what you comment, in fact, I, I think that are the, the three most important things, no? And, and in our case, were, were crucial. First of all, it was to, to find a team because myself as a researcher, I didn't have any experience on uh, entrepreneurship. And uh, I made the decision to look for an experienced CEO to do all these things, because one of the things that you have to do when you start a startup is to negotiate no? all the shareholders yeah, agreement yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. and all these things. And you need a lot of uh, experience and legal aspects. And I was unable to do this. And it's quite crucial to do this better, because instead you can, you can have problems, for example, with investors. They can limit the investors or something like that. So it's quite important to do so. And also the university helps a lot in, in the first uh, stages to look for uh, grants that you need to start your work and also in the business plan. And the business plan is crucial, no? Uh, it has to be done in a correct way to convince the investors. Yeah, and yeah. I had a lot of uh, support from the university to do so. So the, the team started with you, and then you found a CEO from, from within the university or someone from outside uh, in Barcelona, in Catalonia? He was from outside, but I had the support from the university to meet uh, some people uh, that they uh, already know uh, from the, the ecosystem yeah, in Barcelona. Yeah. So that was the second person. And the third person? The third person, <laughs> uh, yeah, the third person is the endoscopist, is the, the okay. medical professional yeah. that knows about the problem, yeah. no? Yeah. Because one of the, the most important thing is uh, before, no, before creating the startup is to talk a lot with people that know the problem yeah. and uh, make a lot of interviews, yeah. no, to, yeah. to know yeah. everything, yeah. no? And what's your role now? What's your job title? Or what do you, what do, yeah. you do? I'm CTO. CTO, yeah, yeah. And so did you, can you say a bit about how you raised money? I mean, what was the story for raising money to support the company? In order to start this project, we had to look for money. And the first grant that we get, it was a grant from uh, Catalonia government that it was for projects with potential to transfer to the society. With this grant, we, we filled the patent 
and we uh, started with, uh, with the market research and all of this and we saw that it was maybe it was the way and we decided to go for it for, for the, the, the technology transfer no, of this project and then we look for another grant that there are some here and with this we could uh, do the first prototype and the first validation with ex vivo samples and once we had this and um, the business plan uh, we applied for another grant that it was in fact uh, an investor yeah, yeah. And yeah. then uh, this was uh, when we get this grant, this was the, what triggered the creation of the company. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And there's a big difference, isn't there, between what a, a grant giving organization is looking for compared to what a financial investor yeah. is, is looking for. And I mean, in my experience, that's something academics and scientists, um, you know, that's a big change for them, thinking about how to write a grant application compared to how to write a business plan to try to raise investment yes. finance. So one of the, the frameworks that I talk about is you, you have the science and the scientists, which is what you had, and you need to find the money and the management. And that's what you've done. So that's great. Yeah. So we talk a lot about startups and you know, spin-offs, spin-outs, but then there's also the conversation about scale up. And certainly from the UK, there's been a lot of focus in you know, the last 10, 15 years on you know, startups. How do you get these things going? How do you set up the spin out companies from universities? And scaling up a business, well, any business, you know, and I'm not an expert to talk on this, but you know, scaling up a business that started from a university, it's a sort of continuation of this transition that we've been talking about from you know, being a, a researcher, a scientist, thinking about the applications, having to learn about lots of different parts of, of, of the world, really. Um, and I, I think for me, it's a continuation of the team building and thinking about as we scale this business, what sorts of expertise do we need? In a university, you're not going to be sitting there thinking about the sales and marketing activity or the financial function or, or whatever it might be. But as the company scales up, these are things you need to, to think about, obviously. But also, I think for the, for the founding scientists, it's quite an interesting journey to leave the university, join the company, staying with the company, how your role as a founder may evolve and what particular areas that may take quite often in the sort of general model of spin-out company formation. Generally, it's so much it's about learning, learning what a business is, learning to be a business, learning what the, the immediate priorities and the focus is and having the plan to deliver the business goals. So in a sort of general sense, it's not that different to being a scientist probably because you're you know, thinking about the projects, writing the grant applications, pursuing the science, but it's just the, the, the focus and the objectives may be, may be you know, more to the fore of what you're thinking about. For your business, the, sort of the, the pathway is relatively well understood, isn't it? It's relatively yeah. well trodden. I mean, you, you need to do this, 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 yes. and, the, and then if it works, great, you, yeah. you, you know what'll happen. In, in some other business areas, there isn't this sort of standardized pathway of, like you say, the regulatory, the clinical trials, getting yeah. all of, all of the, the support. Um, and so I guess that provides you with your, your, your track for, for scaling up. Um, but for many other businesses, there isn't. And, and one of the things I've seen with quite a lot of startups is initially, um, the breadth of the opportunity is huge. You know, we've got this amazingly exciting technology. It could do this, it could do that, it could do a very wide range of things. So how do you focus? And that's one of the common challenges for a spin-out is, mm -hmm. is um, instead of trying to do everything from a technical point of view, um, thinking, you know, to satisfy the investors. For you, the pathway is relatively well understood, but even so, you have to understand how you're gonna get into the clinic. At what stage is somebody going to pay money to take your technology and replace something else? You know, so use yours instead of something else or you'll use yours in addition to something else and all of the challenges yeah. of, of that. Yeah, you have to do the things very easy no, for the people who is using this okay. and, and uh, communicate a lot what is the benefit of using your tool yeah. uh, instead of what is in the hospital. Yeah. No? 
And in our case, for example, our device is a complementary device, so the hospital will pay more yeah. to do the yeah. same thing. But we have to convince them that finally uh, there is a savings because uh, you are uh, treating better and you are detecting more, more cancers. No? And finally, the, the, the savings will be uh, in terms of treatment no? because yeah. you, are not, you have to not treat uh, cancer people. I mean, I know from my own personal experience, having been involved with UPF for God, say, five or six years now, that you know, UPF as an institution um, provides a lot of support and is really wants to encourage researchers to get involved in you know, all, all sorts of knowledge exchange, knowledge transfer and, and technology transfer. Um, and I know you've said you've said you benefited from that. Maybe you can just t tell me sort of what was it like for you? Yeah, in fact, it was uh, very, very helpful uh, having the university behind because they help a lot in identifying the grant that you can apply. Uh, they help you in the proposal and they, for example, uh, when we had to uh, fill the pattern, uh, they give you su support with this. And, and this is the, the business shuttle the unit? Yeah, yes, yeah, yeah, the yeah. business shuttle. Uh, and then uh, when I was in the middle no, of, uh, of the project, uh, the UPF Ventures was created and it was very great, uh, great because we were the, like the first project yeah, yeah. and they put a lot of effort uh, with us and in fact they uh, developed our business plan. Uh, and it was great. Yeah, I think that the, the, the support is crucial because uh, as, as researchers, we don't know how to do this. I mean, in one, in one word, I think the word is impact. And, and this is certainly the, the, the dialogue in the, in the UK for the last sort of 15 years. It's universities thinking about how they can generate a positive impact on society. And that's talked about in terms of benefits to society. Um, and the impact can come from you know, all sorts of different benefits. That it might be economic. So we might be talking about business and economic impact. But crucially, we're also talking about social impact, cultural impact, um, uh, policy impact. And so I think this is something that is relevant to every activity in the university. And you know, technology transfer you know, started really within the, you know, the, the engineering, physical science, life science departments. But as the concept has broadened from technology transfer to knowledge transfer, knowledge exchange, sort of thinking far more broadly about how universities impact society and deliver benefits to it. And I think that's what universities want to do. I mean, that's where this is, is, is all coming from, is thinking it's, you know, we're not just sitting here in the university behind the closed doors. You know, publicly funded institutions need to be able to demonstrate the benefit, uh, the impact that they're having on society, is that sometimes, and you know, this is what, what I say quite frequently, you know, sometimes the commercial route is the best way to deliver benefits to society. And, and yours is an example of that because you know, sometimes you, you've, you've got some great ideas, some great um, prototypes, some, some great plans, um, but unless you can get private investment to come in and develop it, it's just not gonna get through to market and work with people who know how to get things through to market. So sometimes, you know, within this broad concept of generating impact um, and benefits to society, sometimes the commercial route is the right one. And as we were saying, uh, it's, it, the, the motivation isn't the money, uh, that's a possible byproduct from it. In the UK, the universities are independent charitable bodies, so they're not actually um, owned by the state, they're not state uh, entities. So the people who work in them aren't government employees, they're not public sector employees. And I think there are two important points about that. One is to do with the sort of the culture, you know, the, the way researchers think about the possibilities of doing things independently and getting involved in, in knowledge transfer. And the second is, is quite simply some of the rules and the bureaucracy and the regulations about who is a, a allowed uh, to do what. And I think a consequence of that is that 
maybe you know tech transfer got going earlier in the UK, um, but now what I've seen, you know, and, and that happened because of the independence, because of the possibility to do it, uh, the desire to do it, and the relative lack of uh, sort of bureaucracy. Whereas now I think, you know, from what I see in Spain and Italy and elsewhere, where they are public sector employees, public sector institutions, that change has happened and culturally now it's more acceptable, it's completely acceptable for, for public sector researchers here to decide to get involved in knowledge transfer. But I guess you've, I mean you've, Marty, you've lived this experience, haven't you? And um, probably in the last few years it's, it's, it's been okay and it's, it's been a lot easier to do than say 15 years ago. Yeah. But I wonder if, if, if you recognize any of that in your experience. Yeah, in fact, now I've seen changes, no? and maybe it's like eight years ago or something like that, that I began to uh, think about uh, transferring no, the, uh, my research into the society. And at that time, maybe there was no so much uh, experience as now. And personally, I could felt a little bit, no, what you are saying, that maybe is not ethical, mm -hmm, let's say, mm -hmm, to do mm -hmm. so, no? Uh, because people think that uh, you are going to make money uh, of the, your, your research. But now uh, I, I, uh, uh, there are many, many, many uh, startups that are coming from university. I agree that th things are changing. No? In fact, in Barcelona, I have, uh, above all for these health uh, projects, no? it's a very uh, good uh, place to be because you have a lot of uh, first range hospitals, for example, yeah. to do your validation. In case of pharma, for example, you have also very big pharma around. And also you have investors, local investors, that could help in the first stages. Uh, and uh, you have, uh, for example, these, these grants no, or these training programs that uh, are, they are quite uh, good programs and above all focused, for example, in the health uh, sector no? and, and it's very helpful at the first stages. Yeah, I mean, I, I've seen, I think in the last, say, 10 years, but certainly the last six or seven years that I've been coming here quite a bit, I, I think, you know, the Barcelona sort of tech community has, has developed enormously. Um, and I think it's a combination of what the universities have been doing, but what the, the Generalitat, the local government's been doing um, to actively decide to support this. And there's a number, as you say, there's a number of agencies providing support. Um, there are a number of ways that you can access money, but it, it's about so much more than that. It's about the people, it's about the community of people and the, the, the networking. And you know, you go down to the waterfront in Barcelona Tech City. You know, you've got a sort of physical manifestation of of the buzz that's going on here. 